Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, this is another wonderful day that the Lord has made. Amen. Uh, recently, just some posts that are on Facebook and some other blogs, the issues of judgment and grace came up. And it seems that there is an opinion that every time somebody says something that may be critical or someone confronts sin in a camp, there's this common theme that that's judgmental or that that's not grace or that's an unloving thing to say. But as I went through these conversations, something occurred to me. Our physical bodies have immune defenses designed to stop physical pathogens. And just as our bodies have those defenses, so the body of Christ also has defenses to stop spiritual pathogens. And today we're going to be going into Matthew 7. Many people know the first verse of Matthew 7, which reads, Judge not that ye be not judged. But unfortunately for many, the whole passage stops there at that first verse. And much of the time, they use it either to cover up their own sin or to cover up uh, the sin of others. Maybe their favorite politician, maybe their friend, maybe a loved one. So I'm going to go in through the, the whole chapter. Hopefully we'll get through the whole chapter today. And just go over and unpack what the Lord Jesus was really telling us. And in verse, I want to read the first couple of verses here. It says, Judge not that ye be not judged. And verse 2 says, For what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Verse 2 implies that we're going to judge. And let's be honest, folks. It is impossible for any man, woman, or child not to judge. If you are alive and you're not a vegetable then you at some point are going to be judging. We judge people every day on whether they're good or bad, whether they're trustworthy or faithless, whether they're harmless or whether they're dangerous. As parents, we do this to protect our kids. As kids, we often have to do this. Uh, remember the old things, don't get in the car with the stranger? Why do they tell you not to get in the car with a stranger? Why do we tell children that? Because not everyone is good. There are bad people. There are people that if you get in the car with them, if you trust them, they will kill you. Employers go through uh, intelligent interviewing techniques designed to determine whether a prospective employee is going to be faithful, whether they are as qualified as they say they are, whether they know what they claim to know. So we have to judge while we're in this world. So verse 2 tells us that verse 1 is not saying that we don't judge, but what verse 2 is telling us about what Jesus is saying is that we will be held to account for how we judge. If we judge for selfish reasons, if our judgment is full of lies and spin, if we're trying to gain the system, the stack the deck so that we look good and the, the guy we don't like looks bad, Woe be to us. If we condemn, rail against someone and say, you just committed a heinous crime, may the judgment of God fall on you. And then in the same sin in our life say, oops, it was just a mistake. God is going to judge you with the same judgment you met out to that other person. So when we make our decisions, when we draw our conclusions, we do so as people who must give account. And in the rest of the chapter, the subsequent verses here, Jesus goes into some situations involving judgment. In verse 3, starting in verse 3, he condemns hypocrisy in judgment, which I've briefly brought up. Hypocrisy uh, has to do with the, the hypocrites in the old Greek theater. And a hypocrite was someone who wore a mask. And there were people who were doing, they were railing against people they didn't like looking for things for which to accuse them. And then they were doing the very same things that they saw their enemy doing. And in verse 3, let me quote here, And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the beam in your own eye, or the plank? How can you say your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye. Hypocrite! First remove the plank from your own eye, then you will see clearly remove the speck 
that is in your brother's eye. In other words, God wants us to live with integrity. He wants us to judge with integrity. We are in no position to look down on someone else for a sin that we are even a worse offender than they are. If we're going to, he's not saying don't stand against sin. He's not saying don't speak out against sin. But he's saying we first have to wash our own life. If, if we see lying and spin in the congregation, we have to watch out for lying and spin in our own lives. If we are full of spin, then we need to get rid of our spin before we confront the spin in other people. The Bible says in Peter that judgment begins in the house of God. So we must conduct our lives with integrity. We must not make decisions out of our own selfish ambition. But we must seek the heart of God. Let us never speak against somebody because it is our own selfish ambition, because it serves our, the wants of ourselves to do so. But let us do it because we are pursuing the righteousness of God, the love of God. The purposes of Jesus Christ. Jesus says in verse 6, Do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn and tear you to pieces. It says, Ask it will be given to you, seek and you will find, knock it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and everyone who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. Or what man is there among you, if his son asks for bread, Will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask them? Therefore, whatever you want men to do, do you do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Again, he's reiterating we need to conduct our lives with integrity. We treat others the way we would want them to treat us. We would judge others the way we want them to judge us. When we make our decisions concerning how we treat others, and in verse 7 through 12, it's talking about how we treat God and how we treat the things of God. Let me repeat that. Verse 7 through 12 is focused on how we treat the things of God. God is generous. He gives all who ask to all who seek. What that means is that when we're dealing with people who are genuinely seeking God, and when we have to confront them, and Matthew 18 gives us a process for which we confront sin in the camp, for how we to confront sin in the church, where the first talk to our brother and say, hey, there's something going on in your life that's not kosher here. Let, let's deal with it. And then if he refuses to listen, you get a few witnesses. And if they don't listen to that, then it's brought before the church. And if he refuses to listen to the church, then you treat him like a heathen. That means basically you give him the left foot of fellowship, you remove him from the fellowship until he can repent and come back in. But with those who are seeking God, you deal with grace, you deal with gentleness. You don't set out to crucify them. But it also says do not give what is holy to the dogs, what is holy before swine. Those who refuse to seek God, those who refuse to repent but claim to be a Christian, who are playing the part of the hypocrite, we are to confront with boldness. And there's a reason why we must confront and in multiple places in the scriptures it talks about confronting false teachers. It's and, and, and false brethren, false teachers in practice, uh, people who taught false doctrines were confronted very boldly in the Bible, but also false practices. Uh, we must remember that it is in the age of grace that Peter spoke boldly to Sapphira and saying, the men that carried the body of your husband are here waiting for you because you did not lie to men but lied to God. And she fell out. Paul thoroughly rebuked Alexander the coppersmith and said the Lord's going to get him because he did me much evil. Uh, one of the Herods got ate up with worms because people worshipped him and he refused to give glory to God. Let, let me assure you folks the judgment of God is alive and well in the New Testament. 
In 1 Corinthians 10, it talks about the things that happened to Israel. How the earth swallowed them up whole. And it gives this warning. These things happen to them as an example on you upon whom the ends of the earth have come. Hebrews, the 12th chapter, the first 10 or so verses, it talks about uh, the chasing of the Lord. That if you're suffering chastisement, He is dealing with you as sons. The judgment of God is real. Amen. And how we treat others, how we treat the things of God is going to come back to us. Amen. So when we judge, when we make our decisions, we are drawing conclusions, we do so as those who must give an account. Amen. So we, we need to have God's priorities here. Are we going to judge? Yes, we cannot not judge. It's not possible not to judge. But we have to think soberly on how we judge, how we make our decisions, how we draw our conclusions. Not only to the outcomes, but the process that we use, the, the, the logic we use, the thought process that goes into that. That it's one that glorifies Jesus Christ. One that's done within the context of knowing that we are going to answer to God for what we do. We will all appear before the throne of Christ someday. And we will answer to Him for what we have done in this life. And in verse 13, Jesus just cuts to the chase here. He says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way that leads to life, and there are few who find it. In this society, we have many people that talk about that there are many ways to God. And they're doing a hypocritical bait and switch like I talked about earlier. Where they're want to pull the speck out of one person's eye but not the beam out of their own. They condemn, want to condemn Christians because we say Jesus is the only way and they proclaim that there are many ways of God but they're proclaiming that their view is the only view. They're doing a bait and a switch and the reason that the bait and a switch is going on is it's ultimately a trick of the enemy. It is a trick of the devil to get God's immune system to drop its defenses so that spiritual pathogens can come in, make the body sick, put cancer to the body, make the body of Christ wither away so that the body of Christ is un unable to be effective in doing God's work on the earth. And going on here in verse 15, Jesus said, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing. There's a reason verse 15 follows 14 and 13 because the people in verse 15 will tell you, oh, that's too narrow, that's too narrow, that's, that's not the only way, there are many ways uh, to God, I'm a way to God, come to me. And you have all these false prophets, these false Christs that put themselves, that exalt their way against the way of Jesus Christ. What does the Word of God say? There is one name under heaven by men, whereby men must be saved. And in 1 Timothy 2.5, it says that Jesus was the only mediator between God and man. Amen. Jesus Christ is the only mediator. Amen. But he tells us to beware of them. And in verse 16, and I want to say this several times, you will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. Fruit testing requires judgment. What the Lord is saying there is that by their works, by their fruit, you will know if they are an authentic teacher of God or if they are a bad teacher of God. And a judgment here is pronounced against those who are the bad trees. What happens to them? They are cut down. They are thrown into the fire. What is he saying there? He is saying that these false teachers are going to be thrown into hell. They are going to be thrown into the lake of fire on Judgment Day. Amen. This is in the same chapter that starts out, Judge not, lest you be judged. The Lord Jesus Christ is not saying to suspend all judgment, to suspend all decision making, to never draw conclusions about people. He's not saying that that is ungracious. The most gracious thing to, done in, to be done in the body, the most loving thing we can do for God's people, is to out false teachers, out wolves. Get rid of the wolves. 
You see, you walk, I walk down the street and I see someone beating on a kid. The way of peace is not to look the other way so that he can continue to beat the kid to molest the girl. If I see a man beating on the girl, I am going to stop, put a stop to him. And do whatever I need to. If I have to take him out to protect that girl, then I will take him out to protect that girl. Or what? That's not an unloving thing. That's not a violent thing. That is how I love that boy and girl my neighbor. The Bible says, love your neighbors yourself. If I see somebody who's being victimized, look in the other way because attacking the perpetrator is unloving. It's not very loving at all. The most loving thing I can do is to protect the victim. Amen. If I love my kids and somebody's attacking them, I'm going to confront them. If I if violently, if necessary. Why? Because I love my boys. I'm reminded of that scene, the opening scene of the movie Courageous, where Nathan Hayes gets his truck ripped off, and he ch he chases his truck down the road, and he's on the outside fighting the guy that stole his truck. And at the end of the scene, um, he gets knocked into the side of the road. Uh, the, the truck uh, head-on collides into this tree and it's revealed why he was fighting savagely. He was fighting this thief savagely because his baby son was in the truck. He loved his son that much that he was not only to risk his life to save his son, but he was willing to get physical with the bad guy. And in the body of Christ, and particularly on those who have leadership responsibilities, we must do the same thing. When we see wolves attack the flock, the most loving thing we can do to the flock is to attack the wolves, to rid the flock of the wolves, to take out the wolves, to give them the boot, and to let it be known that the wolves will not attack the flock on our watch. And I take seriously that as my responsibility as a man of God. That when I see the wolf attack, I will attack the wolf. I will say things that people think are ungraceful or unloving or judgmental. And people will do things like take Matthew 7 1 out of context, but let it be known. I, I will not tolerate wolves attacking the flock on my watch. I have a God given responsibility to confront false teaching, to confront false practices. And I say this not to lift myself up as anything. I am nothing. I am only the servant of God. But that is my God-given responsibility. And when more of, of God's leaders take that responsibility, they take it with humility, they take it with sobriety, understanding the seriousness, understanding what is at stake. It is nothing less than the souls of men, women, and children. Amen. It is their lives that are at stake. It is because the church has refused to confront the bad guys for so long. It is such a mess. The church of Jesus Christ in America in many quarters is looked at as a circus. You walk into many congregations today and it is a free ring circus. That's why Jesus said, I don't know you. That's why Jesus said, I'm on the outside knocking. They claim to be churches of Jesus Christ, but everything but the agenda of Christ goes on. But nobody wants to confront these wolves because they're afraid to be called judgmental. They'll be told, oh, that's not grace. Or that's legalistic. Or that's unloving. No, the most loving, graceful act that a man of God can do is to confront these wolves. To rid the flock of these wolves. Amen. To be the immune defense for the body of Christ. What does our immune system do for us? How does it protect us? It eats the bad guys. The technical term is phagocytosis. And basically that's where the immune cells eat the bad guys before the bad guys kill us. And without those defenses, we would all die. We would all be dead. Because we live in a world that's physically dangerous. There are all kinds of pathogens, germs, bacteria all over the place. We don't see them, but they're there. And without a physical immune system, we would soon die. And we live in a world where there are thousands, millions of spiritual pathogens, spiritual threats. We have an enemy called the devil. The devil has uh, fallen angels that follow him. 
There are false doctrines out there. There are false practices out there. There are false ideologies out there that constantly threaten the body of Christ. The body of Christ is threatened by political ideologies. There are people in the body of Christ who follow Obama as if he were the Messiah instead of Jesus. There are people who follow Ron Paul as if he followed Jesus. And you go overseas to these other countries, uh, the various politicians that are over there have their followers. There are people who claim to be Christian, but they teach uh, a gospel that's basically communism and a Christian rapper. Uh, the term for that is liberation theology. It is nothing more than communism and Christian rapper. It has nothing to do with freedom. Everything to do with putting God's people in bondage to a political ideology. The threats don't stop with politics. There are threats in the popular culture. There are people who say, oh, you, you, can't, you can't pray here. Separation of church and state. And so Christians can't pray, but the, see, these same people look the other way when atheists preach their religion. When, when Muslims try to force their religion against spiritual pathogens of the body of Christ. Or when they bring Harry Potter and they say, oh, that's not religious. Even though it talks about witchcraft, even though Wiccans take that book seriously. So there, there's all kinds of threats. There's threats in the popular culture here. There, there's cliches, there's sound bites we hear. If it feels good, do it. And it's okay as long as it's between two consenting adults and no one is harmed not telling you that they are harmed when they're doing things that are outside of God's law. Even if they may give consent, people give consent all the time to things that later on harm them. I have to confess in my own life, there's things that I chose to do. When I did them, I chose to do it. Only to later on have we regret it. So just because somebody consents to do something does not follow that the choice is wise, that the choice is good, that the choice is beneficial. What did Paul say? All things are permissible, but not all things are beneficial. In other words, because God has given us free will, there, there is a wide, the world is wide open to the choices we make. But as Jesus said, we choose as people who give an account. So we choose selfish things. Don't be surprised if we get major back to us, people stab us in the back because they're also choosing selfish things. You choose to stick it to your brother. Don't be surprised if someone sticks it to you. We make our choices as those who must give an account. And there are consequences of that here in this life, and there are eternal consequences. And, and Jesus wraps up. Uh, the chapter here. Uh, I'll start in verse 21 here. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, be he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Who is he talking about there? Is he, He's talking about religious people who are going to end up going to hell. Because the description that these people give is a description of someone who's quite religious. Leaders of ministries. I'm going to be blunt to you. There are pastors, deacons, bishops, archbishops, who will split open the gates of hell on Judgment Day. Amen. They held high positions in the church, but they never knew Christ. Mm -hmm. They were widely esteemed in the church. Some of these are the kind of people who made known to you their title, made known to you their high position, let you know they were the boss. They were, they both, they were the ones who boasted that they were the most from coast to coast. They were the Laodicean church that Christ said, I'm about to spew you out. And some of these people on Judgment Day will be spewed out. There are popes who will go to hell. There are televangelists that we've seen on TV who will split the gates of hell wide open. And it's not my place to name names. Or to even know which is which. Other than to watch the fruit of some ministries that have not preached the gospel of Christ. They've preached self-centeredness. Uh, there's one uh, prominent televangelist who can't make up his mind whether Jesus is the only way to heaven. He's been interviewed and he, he dodges the question. He can't make up his mind. He's got tens of thousands of people in this church. Millions of people follow him. 
If he dies, if his heart is where his words are, and he dies in that condition, he can rest assured, he will be numbered among those who go to hell. It's not for me to decide whether he is, but if he continues on that path, he's on a bad path. And sadly, there are millions that are following him who think of this man as a man of God. And in verse 24 here, and this is the charge to us because ultimately our decisions need to be based on the rock. It says, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him unto a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rains descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And <clears throat> and the rain descended and the floods came and the wind blew and beat on that house and it fell and great was its fall. In other words, our decisions that we make, the judgments we make, need to be built on the words of Jesus. If you're not immersed in the Word of God, that's time to get in study the Bible. Study to show thyself an approved workman. Find out what God is saying about the issues of the day. We need to know God's take on things. God's take on, on, on what's going on politically. God's take on what's going on in your soul. On how you should respond to what's going on in the world around you. And we base our decisions on God's Word. And you see, you see that was our basic problem of man to begin with since the fall. The sin nature is basically saying the ultimate foundation of everything is me, myself, and I. And when man rebelled against God, we became separated from God. And so no matter what Adam did, no matter what his descendants did, no matter what kind of religious thing we did, it was all based on my decision. And there was no way we could get out of that. There was no way we could escape ourselves. We can't escape ourselves. Everything we do is... So we were in trouble. But Jesus Christ, He came, He died on the cross to put to death that sin nature. What does Romans 6 say? It says that we are united in His death and then we're united in His resurrection. Our sin nature was buried with Him and then a new nature was raised with Him. And when we were raised with Him, the Holy Spirit came into us as a deposit of what was to come. And because the Holy Spirit is within us, we have the possibility of making decisions that are ultimately rooted and grounded in Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit will lead us to study the Word of God, to be immersed in the Word of God. The Holy Spirit will lead us into all truth so that we can make decisions that are rooted and grounded in Jesus Christ. Rooted and grounded in God and not in our own selfish ambition. And so that, that's... That's what we need to pray. That's what we need to seek. To seek God's presence. That's why we worship the way we do to, to seek God's presence. To have Him immerse us in His presence. And when that happens, He gives us a word. Words of knowledge. Insights about people of the future. He gives us the words of wisdom. God works with your mind to renew your mind. In Romans 12, it talks about being transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so God will transform your mind. Transform your thought process where your thought process works according to Christ and not just the selfish ambitions that we all have. So that concludes this message. I hope you, that you all have a blessed day.